ओम भद्रम कर्णे विष्णुयाम देवा भद्रम पश्येमाक्षभेजत्रा स्थिरंगुष्टुम सस्तनु व्यशेम देवित यदायु स्वस्ति न इंद्रो वृद्धश्रवा स्वस्ति न पूषा विश्ववेदा स्वस्ति नस्ताक्ष्यो अरिष्टनेमी स्वस्ति नो बृहस्पतिर्दा ओ शाति 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 so we are studying the mandukya karika um in the third chapter it's the chapter on non duality advaita prakaranam which means the chapter on non duality gaurapada here is trying to prove the claim of advaita that uh, this the ultimate reality is non dual that other than brahman the absolute there is no other existence at all there is that only one reality um and this he is trying to prove with the help of reasoning uh reasoning based on our experience also from the upanishads uh he is giving relevant quotations you see when we look at advaita vedanta which says that there is only one ultimate reality brahman um and this universe is nothing but an expression or a manifestation of that brahman brahman alone is the reality we run up against a contradiction very soon what is the contradiction first we say that brahman is the ultimate reality absolute beyond any change because it's beyond time it's beyond change it's only within time that change is possible from one thing to another so that change is possible within time but brahman is beyond time beyond space beyond time beyond causation so beyond change so that's one thing at the same time you find that brahman is said to be the cause of this universe brahman is said to be the cause of the universe where is it said in uh, all the uh, all the upanishads it says that this manifold this universe it comes out of brahman uh, from which the universe is born in which the universe exists into which the universe disappears that is brahman like a spider spreading out its web like the um uh, plants bursting forth from the earth like hairs and nails growing from a living human body in that way from the uh, im- immutable appears this this universe so many such statements in the different upanishads we find these statements basically they are all saying that brahman is the cause of this universe now unchangeable brahman and brahman as the cause of the universe are actually contradictory why because to be a cause of anything you must be subject to change a cause always changes without changing it cannot be a cause of anything so a seed sprouts to become a plant a milk curdles to become curd or or yogurt yes and so things which change they only can be causes of other other things effects karanam karyam karanam means cause karyam means effect so a cause karanam becomes an effect karyam only by a process of change now immediately you have a clear contradiction the unchangeable brahman is a changeable cause of the universe nirvikara savikara nirvikara means unchangeable not subject to modification savikara means changeable subject to modification how can the two go along together how can the two be true together there is only one possible answer to this two contradictory qualities of the same you can affirm two contradictory qualities of the same entity only in one case when one of them is real and other one is not real how can a thing be a rope and a snake at the same time it can't be it can be if the snake is a false snake a real rope can appear to be a false snake right this is the classic example snake rope example snake rope example is not really a snake rope example it's a real snake and a real rope and a false snake 
how can it be a dry, dry desert and an oasis at the same time? Only if it's a mirage. It's a desert really and it looks like water. So two things, contradictory things, can be affirmed of the same reality only if the one is true, one is real, the other one is unreal. Uh, or what is said in Vedantic, in, in Advaita Vedanta, two levels of truth. Come. Two levels of truth, two levels of reality, absolute and transactional. Um, in Sanskrit, paramartika vyavaharika. That's why these two levels of truth, you find this in Advaita Vedanta, you find this in um, Tibetan Buddhism, for example, in the Madhyamaka Buddhism of Nagarjuna, two levels of truth. Come, come. Now, which one is true and which one is false? We have two, two contradictory qualities. One is Brahman is unchangeable. Other one is Brahman is changeable. To be a cause, it must be a changeable thing. And here, Advaita Vedanta is very clear, very firm. Uh, Brahman, the unchangeable absolute, is the reality. And the so-called causality of Brahman is an appearance. Is, in technical terms, a superimposition, a dhyasa. An appearance. Let me repeat that. Brahman cannot be the absolute reality, unchangeable reality. It cannot be the absolute and it cannot be the cause of the universe at the same time. Are you with me? One of them has to go. Go means one of them has to become an appearance, not real. Which is an appearance? The, the causality is an appearance. Brahman is not an appearance. Brahman is real. But it's causality, it's a cause of the universe, that's an appearance. That's not an absolute reality. Now the two can work together. Brahman is the absolute reality, ultimate reality of this universe. And it is apparently a cause of the universe. Apparently a cause of the universe. So, the karanatvam, the causality of Brahman is mithya, false, an appearance. That is what is called Maya. So, Brahman is apparently the cause of the universe. It seems to be the cause of this universe. If it is apparently a cause, follow this carefully. If Brahman is apparently a cause, then the effect is real or false? False. False. In your dreams, you bought a ticket. What kind of a lottery ticket? What kind of lottery ticket would it be? A dream lottery ticket. <laughs> and in your dreams you won the lottery and got a million dollars. Or nowadays some, what, 250 million dollars, something like that. You got 250 million dollars in your dreams. So, um, the cause was the lottery ticket which you got in your dreams. And the effect was you won a quarter of a billion dollars. But the cause is false. Why is it false? Because it was in your dreams. You didn't really buy a ticket. Then the effect which it produced. The, what you won, was unfortunately, False. real or true? <laughs> False. It's not in your bank. So, which means if Brahman is the cause of the universe in appearance as Maya, then the universe must be real or False. 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 Do you, are, are you following the logic? Mm -hmm. The universe is an appearance, is a product of Maya is an appearance of Brahman. It's not a real product. The universe is not a real creation. All right. So this is what uh, Advaita Vedanta wants to say. So what if the universe is not a real creation? In that case, Brahman remains as not to, non-dual. Brahman is the absolute reality and the universe is not a second thing apart from it. So you can't count the universe with Brahman and say, Brahman one and the universe two. No. Brahman one, in the universe not two. So Brahman is non-dual. It's not a, there's no second reality apart from Brahman. So this is, that is how Gaudapada is trying to prove non-duality in this section. And right now what he is doing is, he is backing up his thesis with some quotations from the Upanishads. Quotations from the Upanishads. Why? Because after all Advaita Vedanta is based on the Upanishads. Literally, 
Advaita Vedanta. Vedanta literally means the philosophy of the Upanishads or the spiritual teachings of the Upanishads. The definition of Vedanta we all memorized when we started studying Vedanta. Vedanta Nama Upanishad Pramanam. Vedanta is the source of spiritual knowledge called the Upanishads. So the root texts are the Upanishads. If you make a, such a big claim that Brahman is non-dual, the universe is an appearance, you better be ready to show it with, with uh, suitable quotes from the Upanishads. So he has been giving us some quotes. We have done verse number 23, 24. I think we're going to go to, go to 25 now. Yeah. In verse number 23, look at the second line. Nishchitam yukti yuktam ja. Which is, nishchitam means which is clarified or ascertained. Um, and yukti yuktam, which is rational or logical. So these two things refer to two stages of Vedantic inquiry. What are the two stages? Shravana and Manana. Do you remember Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasana? Shravana means hearing. Hearing literally does not mean only hearing, but it means what we are doing, systematically studying Vedanta. So by Shravana, this, so what is, the, when he is going to give so many quotes, he is talking about this Nishchitam, the Shravana, the, the study of the Upanishads, and he is giving a sample of some quotes. And last time I mentioned how do you ascertain the meanings of these Upanishadic te uh, texts. So a six-fold uh, system. The Vedantic hermeneutics. Do you remember last time we did it? So, Upakrama, Upasanghara, beginning and end, Abhyasa, repetition, uh, Apurvata, uniqueness, Upapatti, reasoning, uh, Atthapatti, what is eulogized or praise, and last, Phalam, the result. All of them taken together point to a certain meaning. So, if you use these methods, you, I, you can call them Vedantic herme or Vedic hermeneutics. And they were developed by, uh, by the Purva Mimamsakas, the philosophers of the, the ritualistic portions of the Vedas. And we, can, and we borrow these techniques to understand the, the Vedas. What, what verses or what Vedic mantras were quoted? In verse number 24, there are three quotes. Verse number 24, there are three quotes. Neha naneti cham nayad. Indro Maya Bhirityapi. Have you found it? 24th verse? Ajayamano Bahuda Mayaya Jayate Tusa. There are three quotes here. Neha Nanasti Kinchana, first quote. This is from Kathopanishad. It literally means there is no plurality here whatsoever. There is no plurality here whatsoever. By here, it means right here, right now. In this universe where you see a tremendous diversity. There is actually no diversity. So that's, that's the quote. Which means there is a hidden oneness here. There is a spiritual oneness to this manifested. See that we experience plurality nobody can deny. If you open your eyes you will see plurality. Even the very nature of knowledge, subject and object means at least two. So the experience of plurality is not denied. The reality of plurality is questioned. The reality of plurality is questioned. Is this really separate or is there an underlying oneness? In fact, why alone Advaita? Any kind of knowledge is basically going towards oneness. What is physics or you know, the laws of chemistry or mathematics or whatever? They show you an underlying principle. One principle to explain many things. So it's basically a oneness. You may say... What do you see out in the ocean? 10,000 waves. And what Advaita is saying is, you are seeing 10,000 waves, 10,000 entities, but those 10,000 entities are one body of water. In the same way, when you see billions of entities here, see, hear, smell, taste, touch, think about, know, all of it is one existence consciousness bliss. So the Kato Upanishad says, Neha nanasti kinchana. Na, not, iha, here. Very important that here. It does not say before creation it was all one. Now it is many. And ultimately it will all be one again. No, no, no. It says now it is one. Right now. That sounds counterintuitive because we are experiencing many. We are experiencing many. The reality is one. The reality is appearing as many. Again you see the contradictory things. 
Is it one or many? That we experience many, nobody can doubt that. It will be crazy to deny that you are experiencing many. Experiencing many means seeing many things. He seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking about many things. But really what is it? It says really it is one. Now really one and experiencing many, contradictory. How do you resolve it? One must be true, the other must be an appearance. Which is true? According to Vedanta, one is true. And the many are an appearance of that one. Then, the next quote was from Brihadaranya Kupanishad. Indro maya bhir pururupa iyate. This is from Brihadaranya Kupanishad. Second quote. It means Indra ba, uh, assumed many forms. Pururupa, multiple forms. So Indra here does not refer to the king of the gods, Indra. Here it refers to Saguna Brahman. Brahman with the power of Maya. Brahman through the power of Maya assumed many forms. What are the many forms? Why should we care? These are the many forms. What you are seeing. These are the many forms of Indra. Indra assumed all these many forms. Maya, uh, there it means as if by magic. As if by magic appeared now, as if by magic is equivalent to saying, as if, not really. So, Indra remaining as Indra appears as this universe. Same thesis. It is really one, you experience it as many. The third quote, a beautiful one. This is from Purusha Suktam, a very nice hymn from, a beautiful hymn from the Vedas. I mentioned how it is chanted by um, traditional Hindus at, when somebody passes away. In uh, the monks, when they are cremated, before that, this one is chanted by the brahmacharis, novices. So, Purusha Suktam. Ajayamano bahudha jayate. That ultimate reality, without being born, is born as many. Now, look at the contradiction. That ultimate unborn reality is born as many. Ajayamano. It is not born as anything and is born as many. How? So, the only way is, one of them has to go. That unborn reality is one thing, do you give it up, that it is not unborn, it is actually subject to change, or the birth of the many, do you give this up? So, the Upanishads take their firm stand that the ultimate reality is unchanged. This, this thing which we experience is an appearance. Appearance of what? Of that. This is the third quotation, it is from Purusha Sukta. Then, let's go on to verse number 25. Another quote comes. Two more quotes actually. Verse number 25. Sambhute rapavadacha Sambhute rapavadacha Sambhava pratishidhyate Sambhava pratishidhyate konve nam jana yediti konve nam jana yediti karanam pratishidhyate karanam pratishidhyate This requires a little bit of explanation. Two quotes are here. Quotes from where? From the Upanishads. One is from the Isha Upanishad. The Isha Upanishad is one of the smaller Upanishads. Isha Upanishad. It's called the, it, the Isha Upanishad because it starts with the word Isha. Isha vasyam idagam sarvam yatkincha jagatyam jagat tena tyaktena bhunjitha magridhakasya swedhanam. Um, by the Lord, all this moving and unmoving is pervaded. By this renunciation, may you enjoy life or, um, um, or protect this knowledge, I'll explain. And do not covet what belongs to anybody else. So, the first sentence of this one, the first sentence of this first, this is the first mantra of the Upanishad, that's why it's called Isha Upanishad. Mahatma Gandhi said that... Uh, if all the texts of Hinduism were lost, 
and only the Isha Upanishad remains, only the first mantra of the Isha Upanishad, only the first line of the first mantra of the Isha Upanishad remains, all of Hinduism would remain. So this first line is very important. Isha Vasyam Idam Sarvam. Literally it means, cover all this. All this means whatever you experience in life, cover it with God. Cover it with God. Vasyam means, uh, the, the commentator Shankaracharya says, Achadaniyam is to be covered. Come, come, sit. Can you give him a place to sit here? Achadaniyam means to cover. Uh, Shankaracharya very nicely, he uh, comments on this. Cover means to, to uncover. Uncover. Uncover means to discover. So he says, cover everything by God. This is not by a kind of foolish optimism that everything is God, everything is good, everything is fine. No. By investigation into our own experience, you discover. If it is that ultimate reality appearing as this, if it is the one appearing as the many, if we investigate this, will we not find that, that reality? We should be able to find it. So he says, you discover Isha. Isha literally means the Lord. You find the Lord here itself by an investigation into your experience. Which experience? Any experience. It is discoverable. You find that. And then, tena tena bunjita. There are different interpretations of this, multiple interpretations. But one interpretation given by Shankaracharya is this. This knowledge that there is one reality in, in all of our experiences of life. Brahman is there shining forth in all the experiences of life. This knowledge, Tyaktena Bhunjitha, protected by renunciation. This knowledge is to be protected by renunciation. What does it mean? Renunciation here means not that you have to give up everything and go off to the mountains. You could, but you don't have to. Here, renunciation means in all the things of the world, you have to see the Lord. Swami Vivekananda put it beautifully. It means deification of life. He says that it's not that you have to give up the husband or the wife or the children. No. You have to see God, see the ultimate reality, Brahman. See the ultimate reality in, in, uh, in your relatives, in your friends, and yes, even what you think are your enemies. It's the same reality everywhere. Inside and outside you see that same reality. See means here, no. Discover. See is not with physical eyes. So this seeing, this seeing itself, that it's not a multiplicity and therefore I hold on to that one reality and not, now no longer relate to the world as an individual being trying to get nice things and avoid the unpleasant. Yeah. Come, come, come. Can you sit somewhere here? There's space here. So this automatically becomes renunciation. What is renunciation? Do you remember the story of the princess of Kashi? I won't repeat, those who re remember. So what was so, uh, so attractive is realized that I alone am in, in that form. To see Atman everywhere in all beings, in the attractive and in the terrible too, that becomes renunciation. That is renunciation. Renunciation is, the opposite of this is seeing something different from me which I want. That is the essence of worldliness. There is something I have yet to attain, yet to experience, yet to taste. And so I want that experience, that person, that object, that place, uh, that thing I want. And realizing I alone, this Achidananda, the pure being, am in that form. Immediately the, the special desire to have that or the desire to avoid that goes away. How can you desire yourself or, or hate yourself? I mean, people do hate themselves, but that's, they, uh, there it means something else. This is hating some particular attribute or, or uh, characteristic. But you yourself are in all beings, and you recognize that, that itself is renunciation. That's also self-realization. That is self-realization. In fact, Shankaracharya says, realizing the Lord everywhere, what does it mean? The word is Isha. Isha means, Isha means by the Lord. And then Shankaracharya, very beautifully, in one sentence, Isha, it says, Paramatma Rupena, as Paramatma, the, the, um, the Supreme Soul. 
And Paramatma is what? It's your Atma. Yourself. So Atma Rupena. So Isha Vasyam means Atmana Vasyam by, by your own self. So it, the original text is by God everything is pervaded. And by Shankara's Acharya's commentary, by yourself everything is permitted, per, pervaded. Yourself, of course, with a capital S. So this is how the first verse of the Isha Upanishad starts. And so it's, it's a tremendous thing. And uh, Mahatma Gandhi, as I said, he said that by this, if you have this much, whole of Hinduism is there. Why is it so important? Note here, the ultimate reality is both transcendental and immanent. It is within everything, so it's immanent. It's everywhere here. And yet it is beyond everything. And it is your own self. You are that. So Bra Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya Jiva Brahma Vanapara. Brahman alone is real, the world is an appearance, and you are that Brahman. All of these truths are there in this mantra. Anyway, nothing to do with us today. <laughs> the mantra it, which is referred to here in the 25th verse is the 12th mantra of the Isha Upanishad. Isha Upanishad is very small, 18 mantras only. But the 12th mantra of the Isha Upanishad is referred to here. Um, what is that mantra and why is it referred? It's a bit arcane um, and it's complex. Isha Upanishad is small but complicated. We'll do it someday. Um, the first verse is the most important. First mantra is the most important one, which I just explained in brief. I remember a commentary on the Isha Upanishad in Hindi uh, by a great scholar, Kashikaranda Giriya Swami, a recent Swami in 20th century. In Hindi, two volumes. So, 18 mantras, two volumes. The first volume is the first mantra. And the second volume is the 17 mantras, are the 17 mantras. So first, that's how important the first volume is. Yeah, they were voluminous sometimes, the people who would write these things. Uh, I remember an extreme example of this. There was a great orthodox Swami, non-dualist, um, Hari Haranand Giri, I think. He was well known as Karpatri Maharaj. Karpatri because... Uh, he would famously, he would have his food, you know, monks have a begging bowl. So he wouldn't even have a begging bowl. He was so austere that his begging bowl was the palm of his hand. Karpatri means the palm of, the palm of whose hand is the, his begging bowl. So, so he would, whatever he would get in the palm of his hand, his arms, he would eat that only. So that, so that, that became his name. But he was one of the leading orthodox scholars of, of Vedanta. So he has... Um, a multi-volume commentary on uh, uh, on a certain section of the Vedas. And the introduction to that is the first two volumes. The first two volumes are introduction. Nearly a thousand pages. Nearly a thousand pages, of course, with Sanskrit and Hindi. So, anyway. The mantra referred to here in the Mandukya is the twelfth mantra. What is the twelfth mantra? It goes like this. Andham tamah pravishati ya ye 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 sambhutim upasate tato tato bhuya ivate tamo ya u sambhutya gum rataha. Those who worship the unmanifest, they enter into darkness, into blinding darkness. Into deeper darkness, they enter who worship the manifest alone. Alright. What does this mean? If you find it confusing, you are not alone. <laughs> there are uh, many, many commentators who have commented on this in various ways. But anyway, to us, there is only one thing we need to take here for our purposes. The word used here is Sambhuti. Sambhuti is a word for Hiranyagarbha. <coughs> is equal to Hiranyagarbha. And you might say, what is Hiranyagarbha? Literally, it means the golden womb. So, Hiranyagarbha is the creator, is um, um, 
the more common word for Hiranyagarbha in Hinduism is Brahma, not Brahman, Brahma, the God Brahma. You know, in Hinduism, the Trinity, Brahma, Vishnu, Maheshwara, cre the creator, preserver and destroyer. So, the mythology is like this. Vishnu, who is the creator of the universe, actually, a preserver of the universe. So, Vishnu is in eternal sleep on his couch. He's a bit of a couch potato. So, the couch is, the, is this magnificent serpent, the cosmic serpent, Ananta, with a thousand hoods. And Vishnu is in Ananta Shayana. So, in fact... Uh, I think the Sri Rangam um, image of Vishnu is in uh, is uh, Padmanabha Swami, I think it's uh, Ranganatha Swami, Ranganatha Swami in, in Sri Rangam, yes. So that's the posture. And so it's basically absorbed in Samadhi before creation, the, the state of God before creation. Now how does creation take place? So it's all in a beautiful imagery and myth mythology from the navel of the sleeping Vishnu sprouts this lotus and on the lotus is sitting Brahma, our Hiranyagarbha, who proceeds to create the entire universe. So he is a pretty busy guy. I mean, he is like, he is busy creating the universe. But notice one thing about him. He is created too. He comes up from Vishnu at the start of the universe and then projects and makes the entire universe possible. And when the universe is destroyed finally, the whole universe disappears. Vishnu alone remains with the power of Maya. And Brahma too disappears. In the sort of, we can imagine the, um, the lotus folding up and we drawing back. So it's all imagery, but it, it shows one thing. That Brahma is said to be, Brahma or Hiranyagarbha is said to be the first born, the first created, who creates everything else. Now... In the Mundaka Upanishad, for example, there is a beautiful, the first mantra of the Mundaka Upanishad. Brahma Devanam Prathama Sambhuva. Brahma, the first of the God, the, the Brahma Deva, Brahma was the first of the gods to be manifested or, or born. So if it's born, it's subject to birth and death, subject to change. Vishwasya Karta Bhuvanasya Gopta. The creator of the universe, protector of the worlds. Who is the creator of the universe, protector of the worlds? Brahma. Who is Brahma? Devanam Prathamaha. The first among the gods who was, who was created or born. So it's a gods with a small g, not God. And Gaurapada says, look, the worship of Brahma is criticized in the Isha Upanishad. Because worship of Brahma literally means the worship of this physical universe. It is subject to creation, change, decay and death. It is within the cycle of being born and dying. So Brahma is the root of that. So worship of Brahma is basically worship of the manifest. And the Upanishad says they go into blinding darkness, into deeper darkness they go. That's all that Mandukya, the Gaudapada wants to say. So by the creation of Brahma, by the, by the criticism of Brahma, by the criticism of Hiranyagarbha, criticism of Jagat, Jagat Ninda, the criticism of the, of the universe is meant. Criticism in what sense? It's not real. It's not a real creation. There is a re reality beyond this. By the way, keep, we keep on saying the world is not real, Brahman is real, many people don't like it. You can put it this way, if you, if you don't like it, I personally have no problem with it, I think it's fine. But if you don't like it, you can put it this way. Swami Vivekananda, he said, instead of saying that the world is false, we can say that it's from lower truth to higher truth. Take the world to be as true as you want it to be. But just say that then, God or, or the ultimate reality, Brahman, is a deeper truth. The universe, alright, alright, the universe is a lower truth, a superficial truth. Maya is a deeper truth. Brahman is the deepest truth. The world is the lowest truth. If you want it to be true at all, it's the lowest truth. A higher truth or the highest truth is Brahman. Why I introduced Maya in there? Because Maya is there to come. And also the lecture this Sunday is on Maya. <laughs> so it's, Maya is weighing heavily on me. <laughs> ah. So that, that's what he means. Look at the verse now. It will make sense.
Sambhuti Rapavadarcha by the criticism or the critique of Sambhuti Hiranyagarbha, Sambhava Pratishidhyate, creation itself is negated. Negated means appearance is not negated. You are you can see this universe appearing, but it's not a real creation. If it's not a real creation, the creatorship or the causality of Brahman is negated. Brahman is not a cause of anything. The second quote is again to this effect. Uh, it's just from Brihadarne Upanishad. It says, Ko nvenam janaye diti karanam pratishidhyate. The original from Brihadarne Upanishad is, um, Ajayamanam uh, jayate, jayate eva. Something like that. It says, though unborn, it appears to be born. Similar, uh, similar idea. And then it says, Ko nuenam janayet. Who indeed can create this one? Ko nuenam janayet. Which one? Which one? You, the individual being. So what it says is, us, the jiva, the individual sentient being. The earlier quotation was about the world. Now it's about you, the individual being. Individual beings, we are not created. We are not jivas. We have not proceeded or fallen from God. We actually, though we seem to be separate, we actually are eternally one with God. We are Brahman. So the idea of Vedanta, Jiva Brahmevanapara, the sen individual sentient being is none other than Brahman, is echoed here. Ko nvenam janayet, who indeed can, can create or give birth to this sentient being? The answer, who can do it? It's a rhetorical question. Answer, nobody. In that case, don't we exist? We exist. Yes, what you consider yourself to be as an individual being, this body, this mind, and subject to transmigration, birth and death, all this suffering. This is an appearance. If you would only investigate your own existence, how will you investigate? Vedanta teaches you all that. You know, the, five, the method of the five sheets, Drig, Drishya, Viveka, or in, indeed in the Mandukya. What is the method? What is the method? Of investigation? Avastatra, I hope you have not forgotten. We are doing Mandukya. The original thing was waking, dreaming, deep sleep. And the Turiya beyond that. So that is the method of investigating. As we investigate ourselves, we find that we are not jivas. We are not individual, separate, miserable little beings. Subject to birth, decay and death. We are that absolute itself. We are the Turiya. The Turiya, the Brahman. We are that. So that is... What he means here, ko nvenam janayet, karanam pratishidhyate, the cause, cause of you becoming a separate individual that is negated. That means you have not become a separate individual, though you seem to be. Though we seem to be individuals, if only we would investigate, we are still exactly that same Brahman as we always were. Um, then number 26, um, one more quote, how many quotes so far? No, number 24th verse was three quotes. Neha nanasti kincha nakato upanishad, indro maya bhi puru rupa iyati, brihadarnik upanishad. Number three is ajayamana bahuda ajayate, uh, purusha suktam. Then number four was sambhute rapavadarcha, that is from isha upanishad. Then number five was Ko Nuenam Janayediti from Viradharnik Upanishad. Then the sixth quote is in the next verse. Verse number 26. Saesha Neti Neti Ti Saesha Neti Neti Ti Vyakhyatam Ninhute Yataha Vyakhyatam Ninhute Yataha Sarvam agrahya bhavena, sarvam agrahya bhavena, hetu najam prakashate, hetu najam prakashate. So very beautiful, this is one quote, a famous quote from Brihadar Nikopanishad. Sayesha neti neti iti vakhyatam ninhute yataha. The Atman, your real nature has been explained as not this, not this, neti neti. By this all is negated. 
and by this negation alone the, your real nature shines forth the unborn you the unborn you shine forth so what does it mean neti 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 means in sanskrit it's a compound of na iti na iti not thus not this not this not this neither this not that so what is this neither this not that it's the most accurate description that can be given of you it's your real cv <laughs> how how is that i remember, i must have told you this earlier the many many years ago in india in an interfaith conference so there were people from different religions and i was representing hinduism um so it was a multi day conference in the, it was organized by the sikhs it was the 300th year of um what they call gurta gaddi that means guru granth sahib becoming their guru you know the sikhs have a tradition of 10 gurus and finally the 10th guru said there will be no more gurus from now on this book the guru granth sahib uh, is your holy book it's your guru so that's so that occasion the 300th years and they marked India is home to the oldest religions living religions of humanity and the newest too among the major religions of the world the newest is i think sikhism so that's in india and the oldest is hinduism i was in this uh, interfaith meeting just a few days ago in greenwich connecticut there was a rabbi a pastor and a monk it sounds like a joke <laughs> 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 and and an imam um so the rabbi was saying that so for example our religion judaism is the oldest um among all the religions i was sitting next just down the panel so i just waved my hand <laughs> and then he said oh yeah sorry <laughs> he's there so the, yeah um so hinduism is the oldest and uh, and it of course has evolved over time jainism is next and then a contemporary of jainism is buddhism jainism is not so well known across the world because it was never really a missionary religion so it didn't spread across the borders of india but buddhism was a missionary religion so it spread across asia um and buddha buddha himself is 2500 years ago and almost directly after christ there's a myth of jesus christ actually coming to india but that's uh, a myth um people have investigated this but it's uh, there's no real proof of that but right after jesus christ in fact one of the apostles is supposed to have come to india but in any case the first christian communities they came to india just after uh, jesus christ so it's a syrian uh, christian community in kerala and the so that's nearly 2000 years old and uh, then when islam was first when it started during the lifetime of the prophet of islam the first the second mosque in the whole world the first one is in arabia the second one is in kerala so a group of people came to the southern coast of india to teach islam so the islam actually came to india um, through these traders not through the invasions came much later so that's islam during the time of prophet muhammad himself then uh, sikhism which came up about 500 600 years ago so there was this conference organized by the sikhs and one or two representatives from you know, every religion and somehow the buddhists must have got it a little wrong because they had i think 10 representatives or something <laughs> it's because they thought they had to send somebody to do a chorus chanting so they sent the whole chorus there the choir they sent the whole choir <laughs> these were lamas from uh, a place near mysore in india there's a huge monastery there of tibetan buddhists so they came the dalai lama had sent them so in the in the breakfast at breakfast i i was sitting with the lamas with some of the lamas and one of them could speak hindi others couldn't speak any other uh, english or any other indian language they only knew tibetan and so the lamas said through their interpreter tell us about 
about Vedanta, about the Atman. Now I knew I was in hot water because <laughs> if you say the absolute reality, the unchanged, what we are talking about here, they'll immediately say no. For, for the, the core pillar of Buddhism is the no-self theory. So there is no separate thing called an absolute self which does not change, nothing like that. You realize that there is no permanent self here and that's it, you're free. That there is an infinite being, consciousness, God, God forbid, don't even talk about God. So, it's very interesting that I as a non-dualist, an Advaitin, I, I was at home with the, with the God-centered religions and the non-God-centered religions. So when everybody was talking about we must not fight because we are all chill. after all children of one God, I would see the Buddhists sitting and smiling. <laughs> For, from their perspective, what God? It's a superstition. So, but as a non-dualist, as Advaitin, I'm equally at home with both. I can see you can reach enlightenment through both ways. So how do I express it to them? To the Lamas about Advaita Vedanta, about Atman, Brahman. I tried my best ones like Satyam, Jnanam, Anantam, Brahma. Brahman is infinite existence, consciousness, and they go, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's just impossible. It's wrong. It's just plain wrong to them. Sounds wrong to them. So then I thought, oh, this one is there. So I said, Brahman, I, I said, Asia, neti neti atma, the self is not this, not this. And I explained what it is. And then the person, the Lama who was translating in Hindi, he, uh, he, he turned to them and explained in Tibetan. They sort of went into a huddle, like before the football, you know, they go into a huddle. So these, these lamas, they went into a huddle. And then they came out with beaming faces. And uh, the interpreter said, you are right. Our master, there was a teacher there, a senior lama. Our master says, you can be a good Buddhist. You come to our side. <laughs> so this is acceptable to the Buddhist. Yeah. Ask yes. So, on the same topic, if I were a Buddhist, could I not say that if Brahman doesn't act, it doesn't create, no. it doesn't... It doesn't, um, it doesn't cause anything. No. So what good is it? Why not just have shunyata? Like, like right, right, do? right. What good is it? In fact, one of the things which is, um, terms which is used in Mandukya Upanishad, Brahman is avdhyavaharyam. Literally, it means useless. <laughs> the most worthless piece of thing in the world universe is Brahman. What good is it? Is that a good question to ask in the first place? <laughs> No, what good? That is a profound question. What good is it? The question. At the transactional level, it's no good. The, will it give you food? Will it give you money? Will it will it uh, give you entertainment? Nothing. If, if you have Brahman, you have to create this concept of Maya. Then you have to create the concept of Maya, and then only you get all the goodies. <laughs> I mean, it's a difficult concept. So hmm. Why have it? So what good is Brahman? Understand. Yeah. Yeah. Understanding. To know it is no. What what thinking? What good is Brahman? Why? Only because in order to find what is the truth hmm. behind everything, we try to seek Brahman, and then to go and say Brahman is totally useless because it's not doing all of this seems so counter. No, it's good to ask this question because then it will clear the doubt in everybody's mind once for all. What good is Brahman if you ask me? Practically speaking right now, no good at all. And without uh, without not only that, if I'll ask you one thing, that what is Brahman? Replace the word Brahman with reality. Now you're asking what good is reality? Knowledge. What good is reality? Existence. You see, <laughs> what you're asking is, you'll see the, uh, the amazing thing about it. What you're asking, it's really worth asking. You're asking, what good is existence? Why, why we are asking this is, we think this universe exists. And it's a lot of good and bad things are here. And everything that we have invested in is here. And now you're talking about some kind of very abstract thing called Brahman, which seems to be unknowable, doesn't do anything. What good is it? No, 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 it's not two things. I am talking about this universe itself. I'm talking about exactly this universe, full of all the fun things you're talking about. I'm talking about that itself. And I'm talking about you. To ask what good is Brahman, you have to ask what good is this universe? What good am I? You are Brahman. 
Now, let me answer that. So, for example, you say, what use? Tell me one use. Brahman is the possibility of all uses. It's like asking, necklace is great, a bracelet is great, and the tiara is the best. But what good is gold? The necklace, the tiara, the, the, the bracelet, they're all made of gold. Without gold, you have nothing. So all use, sarva vyavahar aspada, this is one of the terms. All usage is based on Brahman. Brahman it itself useless. But all that we consider useful and nice and worth chasing, worth achieving, and all that we consider evil and horrible and terrible, all of that is based on Brahman. Take Brahman out of it, everything vanishes into nothingness. It's asking what good is reality? If you say take reality away, what remains? Unreal. Nothing. When you say universe is not real, what do I mean? I mean universe is not real apart from Brahman. When now, right now, this is very important to, to notice. Right now what we are experiencing. Right now what we are experiencing here. What is it? Brahman or universe? Both. It is Brahman plus the name and form. That is what we are experiencing. We are not experiencing universe apart from Brahman. You cannot. If you try to experience the universe apart from Brahman, it's like trying to experience um, a golden bracelet apart from gold. It will just disappear. So what we are experiencing, we are experiencing Brahman itself. But we don't know what is Brahman here. It's like looking at that altar and saying, yeah, I can see the altar, but what is wood? I don't see the wood, it's an altar. If I touch it and say, here, it's wood, you'll say, no, it's altar. Because you don't know the difference between an altar and the constituent material wood. Because you do know, you know what I mean. But here we don't know. We don't see it. The enlightened person sees it. In the Drigdrishya Viveka it is said, what does Maya do? Maya, first thing Maya does is, Avarana. It hides. It obscures. What does it obscure? Two things. Within yourself, it obscures Drigdrishya Yor Bheda. The dis difference between the seer and the seen. You, the witness consciousness, and the witnessed body-mind system, the difference is not clear. So you think, I am the body-mind. Internally it does this. Externally, what does it do? Maya, it obscures the difference between Brahman and the universe. Brahma Sargayor Bhedaha. Brahman, it's there, right there. And the universe is right there. But what is the difference? It's like saying, the difference between wood and the lectern is obscured. When I touch it, I say touch wood. I don't say touch lectern. Mm -hmm. It is literally wood and the name and form and function of lectern. Similarly, it is Brahman if you would only appreciate what it is and the name, form and function of the universe. Nama, Rupa, Vyavahara. So what good is Brahman? All good and no good. It is the reality of everything. It's the essence of everything. In fact, if you say Brahman does not do anything. Actually, who does anything at all? It is Brahman which does everything. Can we say that uh, Brahman helps in transcending suffering? Of course it does. The knowledge of Brahman, the reality, takes us beyond suffering. The, the ignorance of Brahman makes it, is, is a, the reason for suffering. Brahman does everything. You might think this is wrong. You said Brahman does not do anything and all the verses are saying, but after all, who does anything at all? It is Brahman with its Maya, with its names and forms. After all, Maya, you say, okay, Brahman plus Maya, as if Maya is something different from Brahman. Bra Maya has no existence apart from Brahman. So it's Brahman plus name and form which does all this. With the mind, Brahman alone is thinking. With the eyes, Brahman alone sees. With the body, Brahman alone is w walking and talking and working. Who else is there in this universe except Brahman? So if there is anything called doing, it's Brahman alone which is doing. Brahman is the essence of this entire universe. Yeah. It is reality itself and it is who you are. And yet, in one sense, it is, uh, it is uh, useless. In fact, the term we use for Brahman in the Mandukya Upanishad, seventh mantra, avyavaharyam, untransactable. What is useful? One thing is used by you to accomplish another thing. So Brahman does not enter into that. Yeah. 
It is the underlying reality of all of that. All the things that you consider useful and useless, Brahman is the reality of all of that. In that sense. Alright. Esha Neti Neti. Now in the Brihadarnya Upanishad, in the Brihadarnya Upanishad, what is uh, going on here? The Brihadarnya Upanishad says, this entire universe is none other than Brahman. It uh, says, this universe which we are experiencing, Brihadarnya Upanishad divides the universe into two parts. Murta and Amurta. Murta means with form or tangible. The tangible universe and Amurta, the intangible, the abstract, a formless universe. It's a very simple division. Anything that you can see, hear, smell, taste, touch with your sense organs, which is tangible to you, that is Murta Brahma, this is this universe. And whatever we cannot directly perceive you know, energy or our um, thoughts, feelings, they are there. We know that they are there. But you, it's not tangible. It's not a physical thing. So all the physical things and all abstract things, whatever we experience in this universe, this is the universe, murta and amurta, with form and without form, tangible and intangible, together our universe. With me so far? Now what are they trying to do? Ascertain the real nature of Brahman. This entire universe of tangible objects. Do you see it? Do you experience it? Yes. It is not Brahman Neti. Okay. I knew that sort of. Brahman is going to be something very abstract and intangible and sophisticated. You know, it will be subtle. Yes, there is a subtle universe of concepts, ideas, memories, feelings. Yes. Are you aware of that? Yes. That's not Brahman either, Neti. So it says, Neti Neti, neither this Murta, nor that Amurta. Then what is Brahman? You will say immediately that, the Buddhist will say it is Shunyam, nothing. Neither the, um, the with form, nor the without form. Not the, neither the tangible universe, nor the intangible universe. In fact, every kind of object, Drishyam, object, Object of experience, drishyam, is negated. If you have experienced it, yes, I experienced it, not Brahman. Sorry. <laughs> I did a lot of meditation and then I had this magnificent, beautiful experience. I saw this. Did you see it? Yes, then it's not Brahman. Mm -hmm. Whatever else it is. I'm not denying that you saw it, but it's not Brahman. Because it's murta or amurta, an object. If you eliminate all objects, he says, nisheda. If you eliminate all objects, what is remaining? The subject. The subject. Oh, you're already trained Vedantins. <laughs> you know what to say. You, the you the subject. Yes. The pure subject, which can never ever be objectified. It's a tremendous thing to say, never ever be objectified, because uh, all that we have known till now in our lives, not only this life, every life is an object of some sort. An object of our senses, an object of, of science, an object of religion, object of knowledge, object of faith, object of imagination, object of senses. So these objects. And so willingly or unwillingly we have this tendency in our minds that when you talk about Brahman, Atman, it's some kind of object. Yeah, a super fine object, but still an object. No, it is not. Here is a deeper meaning of Neti Neti. All objects, if you remove by neti, the first neti, not this, then you will fall into the next trap. Then it is not there. Nihilism, shunyam, the void. So there is nothing. Then comes the second neti, not that either. What is the void? What is there in the void? The knower of the void. It's like this. If you come in there into the hall and ask you, is anybody there? And you say, yes, Swami, there are ten people there. How do you know I counted? I saw them and I counted. So, there are ten people. And then next time I ask you, go and see, is anybody there in the hall? And you come and say, Swami, there's nobody here. It's not strictly true. 
you are there to say that it is nothing, nobody is here, there are no objects here, you must be there. Similarly, when you deny the entirety of the objective universe, everything, murta, murta, by the first neti, this is the deeper use of neti, neti, by first neti you remove everything objective possible. Close your eyes, no universe out there. Imagine the universe has disappeared. Nothing to see, nothing to hear, nothing to smell, taste, touch. You're just a mind. Thoughts. And now shut that down also. You don't remember anything about your past. Anything at all. Everything is gone. Who are you? What am I? Names. All are gone. Memory, your personal narrative. All gone. Nothing. You can't remember anything. Then shut down those thoughts also. Absolutely nothing. You are still very much there. As the awareness. As what? As the witness of the void. Shunyata drashta. That's the witness of the void. That witness of the void you are. One more point here. Are you with me so far? That is what is meant here by very beautiful phrase is used, powerful phrase in verse number 25, um, 26. Sarvam agrahya bhavena, which is completely agrahya, which is completely not comprehensible by any means at all. Not by eyes, cannot be seen by eyes, cannot be heard, cannot be smelt, tasted, touched, cannot be thought of, cannot be spoken about, cannot be remembered, cannot be understood by the intellect. Sarva magraya bhavena hetuna ajam prakashate. By this reasoning, what remains when you do this reasoning? The unborn one shines. Ajam prakashate. Very beautiful thing. What is that unborn one? You. You the reality. You shine forth. When? Right now. So this is the result of neti neti, not this, not this. One more point here. By this kind of reasoning, one is led to the thinking that, so I must blank out the universe and then I'll be able to discover my real nature. I must erase all experience of objects into a void and then only I will discover my real nature. If you think like that, that's a yogic way of thinking. Patanjali Yoga uh, tries to do that by Nirvikalpa Samadhi or Asampragyata Samadhi. In the deepest Samadhi, when perceptions of the world are not, when apperceptions in the mind are not, you see yourself as the unchanging witness of the blankness. You're still there, absolutely present. <coughs> Unwavering consciousness. You realize your real nature. Even mind has shut down, so that realization will come just afterwards, after your mind starts working. So, uh, that is Patanjali Yoga. Advaita says, you don't have to go into that void state. In this state itself, that same unborn one is shining. It's, it's like this, it's called the light of lights. In our Arati, ev <coughs> the evening prayer, we, we chant this, Jyoti Ra Jyoti, Ujala Ridikandara. It's a hymn to Sri Ramakrishna, though Sri Ramakrishna is not mentioned anywhere in that verse. It's a very beautiful verse. In fact, one of our great Swamis, uh, he said, he wrote a commentary on the Khandana Bhava Bandhana, the, the uh, Arati song composed by Swami Vivekananda. He said, the only thing I can compare it to in its grandeur is the Purusha Suktam of the Vedas, which was just quoted now. He says, so in the, towards the end of this hymn, which we sing every day in the evening, in the Vespers, Arati, Jyoti Ra Jyoti, light of lights, Ujala Ridikandara, lighting up my heart, the, the interior of my heart. Interior of the heart, in Vedanta, Buddhi Guha, heart means your, your intellect or your understanding. What lights up your understanding? Consciousness. Consciousness is the light of lights. How? What is the light of this room? This one. This one is the light of the room. Follow this. Just, and follow it in your experience. You can see it right now. This is the light of the room, right? It, it lights up. What, what, is, what does light mean? It, it illumines, it reveals. So it lights it up. 
But the light of this light is your eyes. If you don't see it, it's not present to you. You have to open your eyes, then your eyes illumine. I'm using the word within quotes. Your eyes are the light of this light. What is the light of your eyes? The mind. Unless you're paying attention, even if your eyes are open, you don't see. Hmm? Unless you're paying attention, even if your ears are there. And one Swami used to, if you're not paying attention, he would say, you are here, but you do not hear. <laughs> How is that possible? You are here, but mind is not connected to the... Uh, ears are the light, let us say. I'm not mixing metaphors. Ears are the light of sound. They illumine sound. But then the mind is the light of the ears. Mind is the light of the eyes and ears and everything. It illumines them. Whatever they present, they are like instruments. We are bringing in data. But now you must throw light upon them. What is the light of your attention? Mind. Mind is attention. Mind gives attention. You focus like a beam of light. Um, by the way, there is a nice conference on attention in Indian philosophy, Hindu and Buddhist uh, philosophies, um, 25th, 24th and 25th April, New York University, it's open to the public. Professor Endam Chakravarti, Janardhan Ganeri, a number of philosophers, you look it up, NYU, attention, Indian philosophy, attention. So the mind is the light of the senses. And what is the light of the mind? Consciousness. Consciousness. You are that consciousness. What is the light of consciousness if I ask? No, there is no light of consciousness. Consciousness is the original light. It's the light of lights. It does not require anything else to light it up. It is what is called Swaprakasha. Self-luminous. It shining. Tameva bhantam manubhati sarvam. It shining, everything else shines. You, the consciousness shining, the mind shines. With the mind shining, the senses shine. With the senses shining, the world shines for you. The world is lit up by your senses. Your senses are lit up by the light called the mind. The mind is lit up by the, by the light called consciousness. And that consciousness, by that I mean not the reflected consciousness in the mind, I mean the original subjective consciousness, the subject consciousness, which is not a thing in this. Hetuna ajam prakashate. And that consciousness, which is Brahman, Mandukya, he says, ajam, it is unborn. Actually, then, that consciousness is the only reality. Mind, senses, body, external world, they are nothing apart from that consciousness. That alone appears in different layers as, through Maya, as this subtle, as murta and amurta. Notice how we, be, we begin by saying neti neti. Is murta, is it Brahman? No. The amurta, is it Brahman? No. And then we reach the subjective consciousness, the pure subject, not object. And having reached that, Upanishad says ajam, it is not born. So what about all this murta and amurta? They are not born. They are not created. They are appearances of what? Of you, the pure subject. They are like waves in an ocean. Mind, senses, world, external universe are all waves in that ocean of consciousness. Again, not very difficult to understand. Just take the example of our dreams. That one dreamer's mind appears as a world in dreams. As people, as events, as plants and animals. Things happening good and bad and desirable and undesirable. The whole samsara comes up in an instant. Complete with its own story and history. So it all comes up there and it disappears again. Because even when it exists, it's nothing apart from the dreamer's mind. There's no second thing there apart from you, the dreamer. That's an example. That's an example. Here, consciousness is the reality. Yes. So what's the role of uh, reflected consciousness in this, uh, in the, you mentioned that real consciousness is the one illumining the mind. Yes. True, it's a kind of description of mechanism. Reflected consciousness in Sanskrit, Chidabhasa. It's uh, there, one thing is, we experience it. Right now, if you look at your own thoughts, there are two things you will feel. One is the thought itself, which keeps changing. 
Here you are seeing a pen. You have a thought about a pen, a perception about a pen. You see the hand, you have a perception about the hand. You see a flower, you have a perception about a flower. Three thoughts, pen, hand, flower, changed. But all of them you felt you are aware. You are aware of these things. That awareness is not the original awareness, that's the reflected awareness. So whenever the mind functions, consciousness is in one word, I would always put it in quotes, reflected. Reflected is just a way of putting it. It's the, the example they use is of a mirror. You have one real face. We, I'm not two-faced. I have only one real face. But when I bring a mirror, a second face appears there. So is it, is reflected consciousness another type of consciousness? No, no, not at all. It is the mind shining with the light borrowed from consciousness. That's reflected consciousness. Reflected consciousness does not exist by itself. Yeah, yeah. but uh, I'll come to you. Why is it important? That's what makes everything he asked, useful. That's what makes everything useful. Without reflected consciousness, pure consciousness itself doesn't do anything. But the reflected consciousness, it reveals the contents of the mind. It illumines the senses. Sri Ramakrishna used to say, cooking is going on. And potatoes are jumping, bubbling in the water and jumping. People, a child thinks, oh, look at the potatoes jumping. The potatoes are not jumping. They have no power themselves. It's the heat in that water which is making the thing bubble and, and jump. So consciousness reflected in the mind makes everything possible. Our thoughts, the entire individual experience of a living being that's possible because of the reflected. So you say, oh, then reflected consciousness is the real thing. No, it's not. It's as, as real as uh, when you say moonlight. Moonlight is not real in itself. It's just the sunlight reflected from the moon. And it's a very good example because when you see anything with the moonlight, you can see the things, you can see the moon, shining moon. But the source you don't see, the sun at night. Exactly like that in this world. You see the, the world, you see the mind shine, shining with awareness. But the source of that is not seen. An enlightened person knows where it is. Exactly. We don't seem to see it. We are just, it's right here, but we don't, we are, uh, uh, it's, it's the neatest of tricks. You know, they call it hiding in plain sight. Uh, I'll come to you, she asked the first. Light of light is, uh, comes easier for me, but the, the witness of the void, is that reflected consciousness? Or no, that's the uh, original consciousness. Why is the witness, and there, there's the witness and there's the void, and the void the void is an object. Uh, it's, it's just an absence, yeah. It's an object, in, it's a kind of object, yes. Is it because it is a special object or, or, or then, uh, how is that different then from... If you try it, you will see. Uh, I'll, I'll, I understand your question. How is your deep sleep different from waking and dreaming? In waking and dreaming, consciousness works through reflected consciousness. So right now, through reflected consciousness, I'm aware of the world. In dreams, I'm aware of a dream lit up by my reflected consciousness. Deep sleep is also an experience, but a different kind of experience. Because during deep sleep, I don't feel I am experiencing deep sleep, in which case I wouldn't be asleep. If you just think back upon the experience of deep sleep, okay. it's, it, there the mind is not functioning. The mirror has been taken away. So there cannot be a reflected consciousness. Yeah. Yes, yeah. it's void is like the experience in deep sleep is like the void, yeah. where everything is shut down, yeah. consciousness goes on shining. What's that like? Again, a, a deep question, you know, people ask, why is all this there? Follow this. It's like, Brahman is the reality, fine. Then why is all this there? I know all that Maya, but forget all that Maya and all that. It's just why all this experience is going on? Why? Brahman could have remained well enough alone. Why get into all this tangle? I mean, all your fancy karma, maya, let's just leave it aside for the time being. Why at all? Uh, Somerset mom, um, when he met Ramana Maharshi, as a dis description of Advaita Vedanta, non-dual Vedanta, and says, Brahman created this universe. Uh, and Somer Somerset mom writes in a sort of dry <laughs> humor. He says, I felt Brahman could have let well enough alone. <laughs> <laughs> Why? I can give you a very interesting answer. There are many answers to that. Maya is, of course, a very profound answer, but I'll give you one interesting answer. 
Suppose Brahman did not experience this universe. Suppose. You're asking why is it all this happening? Suppose all this did not happen. What would it be like? Like deep sleep. Like a witness of the void. And therefore Brahman has both. There are only two possibilities. Either you experience everything or you experience nothing. And Brahman does both. You do both every day. You experience the plenitude of life. Yourself as the many. And you experience yourself as the nothing. Nothing means no thing. Things and no thing. These are the only two possibilities. And Brahman is doing both. You can't fault Brahman. Why are you doing this? I say, I'm doing the other thing also. <laughs> True. To do anything, talk about it, think about it, you have to have things. And then you dissolve everything, just the void. And then you have a nice contrast between the two. And Brahman is doing both. You can't fault Brahman. Brahman is uh, at the top of his game. <laughs> I'll come to you. No, wait, the lady there. Shamiji, because Brahman is the pure conscious mind. No, not pure conscious mind. Brahman is pure consciousness. Same being a human, our consciousness, we can define because it is a reflection of the pure consciousness. The pure word we have to emphasize on. Pure here means no, no, no content. Pure means no content. No, it doesn't mean pure. Not does not mean pure. In, not does, does not mean pure in the sense of sattvic. No, what you call, what you are talking about is a pure mind. Pure mind is a sattvic mind. True. True. That is true. Yeah. Day by day, so, that is the enlightenment or whatever, but pure consciousness is the main thing. Right. And pure. And we are human being conscious. But if we try to understand the reality, that's the pure comes. Then I don't understand here. The pure consciousness is absolute, but pure. Surya. After all this. But the reflection should be better if we go close by that. Yes. No? Yes. That is true. When, when you are right, you have pointed an important thing. The more we contemplate these things, there is an effect on our minds. Even this mind, which we have, this mind, which we are using. By contemplating these things, the mind is purified in the sense of the usual sense in which we use the word, a pure mind. That happens. That's why we are asked to con constantly contemplate God. Directly the mind cannot contemplate pure consciousness. You cannot. But you can contemplate pure consciousness with some attributes. Pure consciousness with attributes. The all-loving, the creator of the universe, the all-powerful, or Shiva, or Vishnu, or the Divine Mother. Multiple attributes. And that's, that's, that is the closest you have to God in, in Vedanta. Um, Saguna Brahman, Ishwara. So contemplation, that's why we are always asked to keep on thinking about God. It has an effect on the mind, very powerful effect. It purifies the mind, that, that's right. Yeah, actually, I think the question she asked is almost similar to the one which I am about to ask, basically. You said that in deep sleep you are, you are ignorant still, right? Even though you are witnessing somehow the void, you are not aware of it. it. In other words, you are basically ignorant in that sense. So, in, in waking and dreaming, you are experiencing all these multitudes. And yes. This. So, you, this or that. Now, when we are talking about the real, I think probably I am hitting upon the same <coughs> idea that she, is meant, you know, she asked about. So, in the, in the, in the enlightened state, hmm. Perhaps it's it's a deep sleep like um, setting maybe and, and no, but no, it's not. No. But at the same time you are aware of yourself, right? You're aware of what you truly are. Yeah, but okay. Well, I know what you're trying to say. 
how can you be aware of what you truly are if it's like a deep sleep? Answer is no. What you are asking is an awareness or a knowledge in the mind. That's what we're asking about. So becoming, knowing something through the mind, that's possible only in waking and in, in dream. Yeah. When the mind is functioning. Now, that seems to be unsatisfactory to us because for us, the only source of knowledge, the only place where we have our existence is in the mind. Not so for the enlightened person. The enlightened person clearly knows that he or she is not the mind. He's quite happy when the mind is shut down. He's quite happy when the mind is working. Right now, we, our real nature, the Atman and the mind, the difference is not clear to us. That's why we think the mind itself to be us. What you think to be yourself it's not just the mind. Right now, the Atman, limited by the mind, is what you think yourself to be. The difference between the two is not clear. For the enlightened person, it's clear. Therefore, the enlightened person is equally the Atman when the mind is functioning in waking and dreaming, is equally the Atman when the mind is not functioning in deep sleep. Not thinking, not aware, I am the Atman in deep sleep. No, no, not even thinking like that. That's the mind only. So, you just think about that. If you push there, you... the you are very close to understanding what the Atman is. Yes. Uh, when a, a reductionist or a materialist yeah. uh, is thinking about consciousness, yeah. which state are they thinking about? Reflective consciousness or witness? They are thinking about reflected consciousness. Because they're, in modern consciousness studies, all they are aware of, if you ask what is consciousness in modern consciousness studies, you go to NYU and ask these people. Um, from a Vedantic point of view, they are making a horrible mess. They will sometimes talk about the mind, sometimes about the senses, sometimes about consciousness itself, and all in one terrible mixture. Because the differences are not clear to them. If you ask what is consciousness, they will say, um, conscious activity like sensing, like hearing, smelling, tasting, and then they will go off on a tangent there. But a sensor also sees, so is a sensor conscious? No. The mechanism of seeing is in the sensory system. That's an object, murta. The experience of seeing is in the mind. That's also an object, a murta. Beyond that is you, the witness consciousness, which shines upon this and reveals it, giving yourself first-person experiences. So are they unaware of this? No, they're aware of this also. So that's the hard problem of consciousness. If you ask David Chalmers and all, the whole problem of what they call qualia, First person experiences. How is it possible to get first person experiences? Seeing something, tasting the coffee, feeling pain, this flash of first person experience. There it is reflected consciousness, pure consciousness, reflected consciousness, giving you these first person experiences with the help of the object. What is the object? Could be a sense data, could be a thought or something like that. So they take all of it as consciousness. But Vedanta would slice it more thinly. There is sensory input there, there is mind. And in the mind also Vedanta would make difference between mind and memory and intellect and ego. Mana buddhi chitta hankara. So, and beyond that is the blankness, the potential state of the mind in deep sleep or samadhi. Beyond that is consciousness. Yeah. According to Vedanta. In Vedanta consciousness is easily defined, you know. Just take this definition. Whatever is an object is not consciousness. If there is any possibility, theoretical possibility of objectifying it, then it's not consciousness. This is something just they simply don't understand. If you really understand this definition, it's a definition given by Padmapada Acharya, the disciple of Shankara Acharya, 1200 years ago. What is consciousness? It says, um, Nedam Chaitanyam. Not this consciousness. Or literally, consciousness is not this. Naidam. In all our experiences, if you eliminate the this, you come to consciousness. Consciousness is there, but you begin to ascertain the nature of consciousness. That's what he is saying. Sarva, sarvam agrahya bhavena. By knowing that it is completely not an object to be experienced, you ascertain the nature of the 
Ajam Prakashate, the unborn one shines. What is that unborn one? You, the real you. Let's do one more and we'll stop. Sato hi mayaya janma, Sato hi mayaya janma, Yujyate natu tattvata, Yujyate natu tattvata, Tattvato jayate yasya, Tattvato jayate yasya, Jatam tasya hi jayate, Jatam tasya hi jayate. All right. Now, is a shift. Till now, Gaudapada was trying to show Brahman actually is not born, is not created, is not a cause by quotations from the Upanishads. Now he's switching to reasoning. Same thing, by logic. Remember in the 23rd verse he said, Nishchitam Yukti Tascha. It has to be clarified that Brahman is not the cause of the universe. It has to be clarified by examining the Upanishads, Shravana, hearing, and then by reasoning upon them. By reasoning upon our experience and the teachings of the Upanishads. Now he's entering the second phase, Yuktita, reasoning. By reasoning, he's trying to show Brahman must be non dual. It cannot be born. It is not the cause of a real universe. Okay. What, it, what does he say? The first line is very profound. Sato hi jayate mayaya. Of Sat, Brahman, pure being, causality, janma, birth, origination, creation is possible only through Maya, not really. Do you remember our original, um, the way we started? If when you look at Brahman, what is talked about, about Brahman in, in the Upanishads, you run up against a contradiction. Brahman is supposed to be nirvikara, unchanging, the absolute, beyond time. And yet it is also said to be the cause of the universe. But cause of the universe is within time. Why? Because cause means effect. Seed to plant. From curd, milk to curd. Whatever. Cause is effect. Cause and effect. And cause and effect always means time. Because the cause precedes the effect. Before the effect has come, the cause must be there. It's the cause alone which gives rise to the effect. Therefore there is time. Therefore there is change. So now you have Brahman which, which has change and no change. Brahman is changeless and Brahman is also change. Has to be, have change because it gives rise to the universe. Both cannot be true. What did we do? One. one should go. That means one we have to give up. Give up means you can't actually give up. You say it's not real. Two levels of truth. The ultimately Brahman is absolute unchanging and it is changing only as appearance. That's what he says. Satohi mayaya janma. The absolute being can be born and can create the universe only through maya. Only through maya means only through appearance. The rope can become a snake only within quotes. And the maya is that quotes. The rope appears as a snake, as an error, as a mistake. It does not really transform itself into a snake. So similarly, Brahman appears as this universe through maya. What is Maya? What's this magician uh, which can make the one appear as the many? It's not real. Huh? Sunday, yes. Sunday, come on Sunday. I have taken up Maya. It's the most difficult topic I've ever taken up in my life. Maya. <laughs> but you must confront Maya at least once in your life. So this Sunday, it, it, Sunday is the day. What does Advaita Vedanta say about Maya? Because uh, Maya is the excuse that Advaitans use for everything. They say Advaita is is incorrigible. Any question you ask, they either say Brahman or Maya. If it's a difficult question, yes, yes. If you can measure something, it's Maya. Yes. In fact, I was talking with this scientist, Marcus Du Satoy. He's a mathematician. I met him in the Shivananda Ashram in Bahamas. He is in the same position that Richard Dawkins was earlier. In Oxford, there's a post for the popularization of science. It's a British government position. So he was saying that Richard, Richard yes, took a... Um, militant opposition to religion. He is one of the new atheists. But Marcus has taken a conciliatory approach to religion. That means a dialogue. He is an atheist, but he would like to learn and he would like to give the scientific attitude to the religious community. That's his approach. Now he said, notice, we were having a dialogue. He attended all the classes on Advaita. And so interesting. Um, 
the characteristics of science are two. One is measurability. If it is scientific, it must be in some sense measurable. Two, falsifiability. Falsifiability, popper. No, it is Kuhn, right? Philosophy of science, who said the criterion of truth is falsifiability. What does that mean? It means any statement, you should give me the conditions under, under which I can check it and it is possible to, for it to be false. If a statement can neither be proved to be true or false, then it's not a scientific statement. So I can conduct an experiment to see, so there should be a possibility that it can be false. And that's how science advances, by falsifying earlier discoveries or, or, or um, not discoveries, insights, better and better theories. Somebody said the corridors of science are littered with the skeletons of past theories, <laughs> discarded theories. So falsifiability and measurability. I said how incredible. In Advaita Vedanta, the criterion of truth is unfalsifiability. Brahman is abadiratvam. Bada means falsifiability. Whatever is falsifiable is Maya. Whatever is not falsifiable on principle is, Bra is Brahman, is the ultimate reality. And notice what is not falsifiable is consciousness. What is falsifiability? That I come to the experience or the conclusion that this is not true. If you can do that, you need consciousness. If you say consciousness itself is not real, if you can come to that conclusion, you need consciousness. In principle, consciousness is not falsifiable. And therefore, uh, what is not falsifiable is in Advaita Vedanta, the truth. What is falsifiable is in science, the truth. Measurability. What is measurable is true in science. It's, it's a scientific statement. And in Maya, it literally means that which, which can be measured. Within measure, within uh, measurability. Brahman is beyond measure, immeasurable. Miyate. Niyate means to, in Hindi they say mapna, to, to bring within measure. That is the, the realm of Maya. What does it mean? It means it's the realm of the limited. What can you measure? It's the limited. That which is cut off in time and in space, in quantity. So it seems to be absolute opposite, Advaita and science. But remember, there's a saying that the opposite of a petty truth is falsehood. The opposite of a great truth is often another great truth. So mm -hmm. no, within the realm, we just said lower truth and higher truth. So science works in the... See, Gaurapada would have no objection to science. He would just say it is within the, the, the realm of uh, transactional reality, Vyavaharika, within the realm of Maya. And then it matches. Measurability, falsifiability, it matches. That which is immeasurable and not falsifiable is Brahman, the Absolute. So, Sato hi Mayaya Janma, only by Maya can you expect Brahman to be born or to be created. Natu Tattvataha, it says, not in reality. Brahman is not a cause of anything in reality. Tattva means in principle or in reality. And therefore, next line. You know, in mathematics you use a proof called reductio ad absurdum. Let us assume Brahman is created. Brahman creates the universe. Second line. Tattvato jayate yasya jatam tasya hi jayate. 27th verse. Second line. Let us assume Brahman actually created the universe. Let's assume. Then what will happen? Brahman becomes subject to change. The same logic which I put. If Brahman is subject to change and modification, remember the six-fold changes. Being, uh, being uh, jayate is born, being born comes into existence, asti, vardhate, grows, viparinamate, matures, um, apakshiyate, decays and nashyati, dies. Brahman will be subject to change and decay and death. What kind of absolute will it be? What kind of God will it be? Which is subject to change and decay and death. It will be something like the Hiranyagarbha, which is created and then creates the universe and again disappears at the end of the cycle. It will be a changing reality. Brahman will become a changing reality. Then it will not be, it will not be a God worth worshipping. 
See, a lot of logical problems come. If Brahman is changing, then it also must have a cause. It must have been produced by something else. Because subject to change means the subject to time. So in, it must have been born in time. If it is born, something gave birth to it. So you can ask, what is the cause of Brahman? Then it leads to regresses ad infinitum. If something else caused Brahman, then what is the cause of that? What is the cause of that? You go regresses ad infinitum. Infinite regress. That's a fault in logic. In Sanskrit, the fault is called anavastha dosha or anavastha prasanga. An infinite regression. One problem. Second problem. The so-called ultimate reality is perishable then. It's subject to change. Those, the dualistic religions which say, what are you saying? The real God is real and the God's creation is not real? You don't know what disaster you're inviting. The moment you say God's creation is real, as real as God, in that sense. It can be of a lower grade of reality, Advaita has no problem with that. If it is as real as God, now you have got two things. God and God's creation, because there are two, two realities now. So God and God's creation, then God is no longer infinite. Because there is something other than God now, God's creation. If you say, no, no, it's not other than God, then it's Advaita, non-duality. If it's other than God, then duality. If it's other than God, then God is not infinite. There are at least two real things, equally real things, God and God's creation. Then you have a limited God. A limited God is no God at all. All the great God you worship in all the dualistic religions, it's vitiated by your own logic. It's disastrous. Then that God is subject to death. Your God will come to an end. The moment you say God is really a cause of a real creation, your God will come to an end. It becomes limited. It leads to regresses, regresses ad infinitum, anavastha prasanga. Limited, regresses ad infinitum and subject to death and decay. So God will have to be put in assisted living and then finally gone. <laughs> no. The only logical way of protecting poor God is to <laughs> sub sign up for non-duality. <laughs> and then you become, you and God are identical then. The universe is not a real creation and you are not separate from God. Your real nature is God. But the whole thing is then real and non-real. And the difference is not uh, the difference is due to knowledge and ignorance. You know it or you do not know it. You realize it or you do not realize it. Okay. Now he will go on in this way, next few verses, using logic to prove non-duality. So this was like a regresses ad, inf uh, ad absur uh, absurdum. Reductio ad absurdum. That means, I assume, let the, what, what did we do as kids? Let the sum of the three angles of a triangle be more than 180 degrees, something like that. Then you get a ridiculous result. Then you say, no, in that case it cannot be more than 180 degrees. By the way, it can be, if you have non-Euclidean geometries. <laughs> Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu